Hi, I'm Dr. Steve Pod, and I'm going to be talking about the PR interval as part of the ECG basics course. Uh, this diagram, believe it or not, represents the heart. The uh, top chambers are the atria, and within that, at the top, sits the sinus node in yellow. The normal sinus node rate is between 60 and 100 beats per minute, with a maximum rate of 220 minus the patient's age. In the centre of the heart, we have the AV node, which is in green, and this feeds into the specialist conducting tissue within the ventricles. And here we've got the left bundle and the right bundle shown. Now, when we think about the PR interval, what we're really talking about is the function of the AV node. And the AV node is a highly specialised piece of kit. And it will conduct the impulse to the ventricles in a normal patient between 120 and 200 milliseconds, which is three to five small squares. Now, the reason it does this is so that the atria and the ventricles are coordinated, but also to ensure that messages from the atria are not transmitted without first being checked. And what I really mean by that is that if a patient is in atrial tachycardia or atrial fibrillation, the atrial rates may go as high as three or 600 beats per minute. And if the AV node were a non-specialist piece of conducting tissue, it would allow the ventricles to go at the same rate. And hence, a condition like atrial fibrillation could degenerate into ventricular fibrillation. But thankfully, the AV node coordinates the conduction and such that in normal rhythm, it should conduct one P wave to one QRS. But in conditions such as atrial fibrillation, it will not allow the bottom chamber of the heart to go as fast as three to 600 beats per minute. So here we've got an example of a, a P wave and the P wave morphology and size is largely dependent upon the atrial size and conduction rates. And just to re-emphasize, we measure the PR interval from the beginning of the P wave, here we go, to the beginning of the QRS. So in this case, the PR interval is about four and a half squares and therefore just under 200 milliseconds. So this is normal. In this example, I have drawn on a little bit of green wiring next to the AV node. This is meant to represent an accessory pathway, such as in Wolf, Parkinson, White. So in this example, the atria will depolarize, but it will activate the AV node and the accessory pathway. Now, while the AV node is hanging on for three to five small squares, the accessory pathway will immediately conduct to the ventricle. And hence, as soon as your P wave has finished, your QRS starts. And in this case, the PR interval looks approximately two small squares, so that's 80 milliseconds. What's also of interest is that the accessory pathway does not feed directly into the bundles of HIT or the specialist conducting tissue and therefore it feeds into the non-specialist conducting tissue of the ventricle which conducts slower and hence the QRS is slurred rather than being sharp and this gives the delta wave and a broader QRS. This is a more common finding in patients and that is where the PR interval is prolonged. In this example, the AV node is sluggish, and that can be for a combination of reasons. Ischemia and fibrosis that can come with age. Drug therapy is extremely common within hospitals, such as beta blockers or digoxin. And um, also in younger patients, particularly those that are very active or fit, um, vagal influences can cause the PR interval to prolong. And hence, when the AV node is stimulated by a P wave, it 
takes longer than five small squares, i.e. longer than 200 milliseconds to activate the ventricle. And in the, this example, the PR interval is probably eight to nine squares, so over 320 milliseconds. So this is a long PR interval. So just looking at an example of an ECG, I'll just give you a few seconds to look at that. One uh, bit of advice when looking at the PR interval, looking for P waves, is lead the limb lead lead two as well as V1 and sometimes V5 can be very good for showing P waves. And that's as a function of the axis of the atria compared to those leads. So that gives you the best chance of identifying the P wave. So if we look at this ECG in a little bit more detail, hopefully you can identify the P wave and you can see that the PR interval is again verging on about eight squares, so about 320 milliseconds. So this is a uh, long PR interval. Also, you may notice that the QRS is over three small squares, so the QRS is also broad. And when we look back at the 12 lead, hopefully you can see that when looking at V1, that looks more like a W, i.e. it's below the line. So this is left bundle branch block with first degree heart block. So this shows that this patient not only has a disease or slowing through the AV node, but also has slowing through the bundles of Hiss. So two places that conduction delay is um, uh, easily uh, uh, visible on the ECG. So here's another ECG to look at. And just again, give you a few seconds. It may be easier to identify the P wave in this case in V2 or V3. So let's have a look at that a little bit more closely. Hopefully you can identify that the PR interval here is two small squares or certainly less than three squares. So that gives us a PR interval of about 80 to 100 milliseconds. So that is clearly a short PR interval. On top of that, there is a slurring of the beginning of the QRS. And unlike the last patient where left bundle branch block was present, in this case, this would represent an accessory pathway that's feeding into non-specialist conducting tissue and hence the slurring, which we call a delta wave. So this patient has a short PR interval with slurring of the QRS. So this patient has an accessory pathway. And again, if you want to take things a little bit further, if we look at the 12 lead ECG, hopefully you can see in V1, the whole of the QRS is above the baseline. And this would represent an M shape, i.e. right bundle branch type morphology. And so in this case, the pathway is feeding into the left bundle, i.e. on the left side of the heart, so causing a right bundle type picture on the ECG, i.e. the left bundle is activated before the right bundle. Okay. So I just wanted to put this ECG up last and really to highlight the importance of the AV node and the PR interval. Hopefully you can see on this ECG that the rhythm is irregular and there are no P waves. So an irregular rhythm without P waves is almost certainly going to be atrial fibrillation. Now, what is interesting is that the QRS complexes are a varying morphology and some of them are quite narrow, but some of them are quite slurred or broad. And if I can get my mouse pointer just to look at this QRS here, this one almost looks like a normal QRS conducted through the AV node. Also, it's very important to note that occasionally the RR interval is almost or just above one square, meaning that the rate in atrial fibrillation here is almost going up to 300 beats per minute. This ECG is an example of pre-excited atrial fibrillation. 
what that means is that the patient has gone into atrial fibrillation but also has an accessory pathway that means that these very high atrial rates are able to conduct to the ventricle at very high speeds and this patient may develop ventricular fibrillation and die so this is a very very important ECG to recognize pre-excited atrial fibrillation a combination of AF plus an accessory pathway and the key features are the irregular rhythm and the changing in QRS morphology and the reasons that the QRS morphology changes is when the AV node is tired the atrial fibrillation can conduct to the ventricle through the pathway and when the pathway is tired it can conduct through the AV node or a combination of both and hence the high rates can be achieved and maintained which can be very dangerous to patients. I'll just show that once more. Thank you for listening.